One leaky valve ignited a chain reaction that unleashed an inferno at the Phillips chemical plant. This disaster would shed light on the dangers of lax safety regulations. It's October 23, 1989. Workers perform routine maintenance on Reactor 6 at the gigantic Houston Chemical Complex. It's not a complicated procedure, but it still calls for caution. The high-pressure reactor is filled with a cocktail of highly flammable material. There is no room for mistakes. Step by step, workers follow the maintenance procedure. Suddenly, a deafening hiss pierces the air as the reactor violently releases its entire content into the factory yard, engulfing everything in a cloud of combustible vapors. The workers know it takes only a tiny spark to blow everything up, so they start to run. Two minutes later, a seismic center in Houston registers a mighty shake. Above the Pasadena compound, a large black plume of smoke rises in the air. It's a full-scale disaster caused by one wrong move. The chemical complex was located in the busy industrial area along the Buffalo Bayou. It was owned by the Phillips Petroleum Company and had several plants on site. All these, including Plant 5 where the accident occurred, were high-tech facilities with strict operating procedures and tight safety measures. At least, that's what the papers said. In contrast, reports suggested that the company was known for hiring subcontractors and less trained workers compared to their own employees. These workers made around 65% of what Phillips employees earned and didn't receive benefits like medical insurance or pensions. But it came with a price. On the day of the disaster, a group of workers was assigned to do maintenance on Reactor 6. The reactor produced high-density polyethylene, or HDPE, a material used to make plastic bottles and containers. The 150-foot-tall structure was called a loop reactor. Inside the reactor, a mix of chemicals, ethylene, isobutane, hydrogen, and hexene was heated to 230 degrees Fahrenheit. These materials react with each other at a pressure of 600 psi and create HDPE particles. The particles settled down into six settling legs. These pipes move the HDPE to a tank for further processing. During the process, particles would gradually clog the settling legs, which had to be cleared manually. This was done without stopping the process inside the reactor. A specially designed valve was used to separate the pipes from the reactor. The unclogging procedure was not initiated until all six leggings were clogged, which happened on Sunday, October 21st, two days before the disaster. Employees began the cleaning operation as planned by closing the valve. Only after making sure the indicator read closed, they disconnected two air hoses that controlled the valve. Finally, they physically locked it in the closed position to make sure no reactor content flowed through the leggings during the cleaning. The next step was to open a second valve on the bottom of the legging and remove the plastic fluff. But the procedure was left to be finished the next week due to other work priorities. One could question whether the disaster could have been averted with a different task prioritization. It took a detailed investigation to discover what happened next on Monday, October 23rd. 99% of the reactor's content, about 85,000 pounds, was released into the atmosphere in a second. A dangerous cloud of highly flammable gas spread across the site. A warning signal sounded and workers throughout the plant rushed to evacuate. Unfortunately, there was too little time. Within two minutes, the cloud reached an ignition source and exploded with a mighty force. The explosion shook the entire industrial park and showered it with large chunks of metal. Metal was flying in the air and it's, uh, it's blowing up. Could you feel the impact? Oh, it knocked me about 30 feet. And you just got up and started running? And started running and jumped the fence and ran over the pasture there and just kept on running. The explosion at the Phillips plant was as powerful as 2.4 tons of TNT and registered 3.5 on the Richter scale. The initial blast sent most of the plant on fire. Within 10 to 15 minutes, the flames reached two 20,000 gallon isobutane storage tanks and caused another massive explosion. 
To make things even worse, another polyethylene reactor failed catastrophically 25 to 45 minutes after the first. As chaos ensued, there may have been up to three more blasts. The first to respond were members of the Phillips Company Fire Brigade, who were soon joined by the firefighters of the Channel Industries Mutual Aid Association. Immediately upon arrival, the men realized they had a challenging task ahead of them. Not only was the blaze raging beyond control, but the explosion also destroyed a large part of the firefighting water system. Firefighters had to use alternative sources like a cooling tower, a water main from a neighboring plant, settling ponds, and even the ship channel. Despite these efforts, the severe flames and massive fuel load were challenging for the responders. Finally, after a 10-hour struggle, a combined force of fire engines, Phillips foam trucks, and brigades from nearby plants and local departments subdued the fire. During this time, search and rescue operations were largely impractical. Only the following morning, Phillips employees entered the plant to determine if it was safe for the search and rescue teams to enter. Even though the blaze was contained, there was still a danger of further explosions and structural collapses. Among the first to enter the site were the Occupational Safety and Health Administration officers to collect and preserve evidence. Their investigation not only revealed a significant number of flaws within the plant, but also indicated that the plant's officials had prior knowledge of these issues. After a thorough examination, a potential sequence of events emerged. During the ongoing maintenance, the physical lockout device was taken off the top valve of settling leg number four. When workers reattached the air hoses which regulate the valve, they unintentionally opened it causing the reactor's contents to spill through the settling leg. The investigation revealed a significant flaw in the system design. The top valve's air supply and discharge hoses were identical. This similarly made it possible for a mix-up, allowing workers to connect them in reverse. While the indicator may have shown closed, the valve could have been actually open. The explosion and subsequent fire killed 22 plant workers while another employee died later in the hospital. All of the victims were found within 250 feet of Reactor 6, where the gas leaked. A report to the president noted an additional 130 people were injured in the accident. 35 workers were hospitalized, of which five of them had life-threatening injuries. Over 100 personnel were unharmed after being cut off by the fire. They were rescued by the U.S. Coast Guard and Houston Fire Department boats. The Phillips Petroleum Company suffered property damage in the value of $715 million, or $1.73 billion in today's economy, and another $700 million in loss of income. In a final conclusion of the investigation, OSHA found a serious violation of well-established and well-understood procedures that have created the conditions that permitted the release and subsequent explosion. Simply put, Phillips intentionally overlooked their own safety procedures and standard industry practices. At the Pasadena plant, for example, the company had implemented a procedure that did not incorporate backup protection. Additionally, OSHA found that the actuator air mechanism could be connected at any time, even during a maintenance procedure, and that someone could have accidentally or deliberately opened the valves. In addition, Phillips was accused of inadequate separation between the buildings and the plant, which contributed to a large number of injured and killed workers who simply did not have enough room to perform an effective evacuation. U.S. Secretary of Labor Elizabeth Dole explained, This tragedy is magnified by clear evidence that this explosion was avoidable had recognized safety procedures been followed. OSHA has uncovered internal Phillips documents that called for corrective action but were largely ignored. She also stressed the fact that Phillips, as well as other companies in the field, hire less skilled subcontractors to perform dangerous operations, and it came with deadly consequences. Two months before the disaster, subcontractors opened some piping to a tank without isolating the line. As a result, flammable solvents vented into an adjacent area where they ignited and burned four workers while killing two. On another occasion that a plant operator witnessed, subcontractor workers proposed using reactor pressure to clean plugged valves. 
a procedure that could have led to a disaster of similar scale. In the end, OSHA accused Phillips Petroleum Company of 566 willful and nine serious violations, proposing a total penalty of about $5.7 million. In response to the report, Phillips Petroleum Company agreed to pay a $4 million fine and to institute OSHA's proposed process safety management procedures at the company's facilities nationwide. As part of the deal, OSHA agreed to delete the willful characterization of the citations. OSHA's proposed safety management standards were published in the Code of Federal Regulations in 1992, almost three years after the disaster. These standards revolutionized the petrochemical industry's safe process design and operating practices. As a result, Phillips Houston Chemical Complex in Pasadena like all other similar plants in the country, was able to become a safer workplace. Yet, in 1999, the plant was the site of another explosion and fire that took the lives of two contractors who were burned to death by 500-degree Fahrenheit molten plastic. One more explosion with a fatal outcome took place in the following year. After all the disasters that befell the company, the worker safety seemed to have remained just a dead letter. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.